Um, hello everyone. Um, I am here today with the wonderful B, um, Beatrice ba Ballerini. Yes, that's <laughs> that correct. correct. Hello, hello everybody. Hope you're safe and well. Um, um, yeah, sorry. Come on, tell us a little bit about you. Um, how did you come? So, B is a translator. Um, from do you do just Italian to English or? Yeah, so I do both directions. I mean, I try. Um, it is quite tricky. Uh, but I'll <clears throat> I'll explain a bit a little bit later on why I prefer to concentrate on two languages only. Um, I did my bachelor's degree in, in linguistics and um, linguistic and cultural mediation, uh, and that was in Rome, where I'm from. And then I did my master's degree here in Leeds um, in audiovisual translation, uh, and I specialized in subtitling. Um, one of the branches of my course was literary translation. I decided not to pursue that one because I could choose certain exams from that course anyway so I took some modules um, and one of them was literary translation which was the core module for them just a side module for me um because I wanted to learn specific uh, you know specific techniques on how to subtitle which of course involved programs and a lot of things that otherwise I don't think I would have learned because they're not I mean the programs themselves apart from being really expensive they're not very easy to understand on your own. I think you do need a guide. Um, and in my case, I always need someone to really explain to very clearly things like a tutorial on YouTube won't do. So I needed a mentor to guide me through it. And it was, it was a good choice, I think. Um, and I'm a bookseller also, too. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> also, I love books, of course. I adore books. So, yes. So you're That's in the right place. Um, how was it? That, so did you, when did you start learning English? Um, and wh why was it English that you gravitated um, towards translating from? So ironically, it was mainly from translated books. Uh, because of course, by, by reading Italian translations of your know, Harry Potters and all that stuff, um, mainly fantasy, because that what I gravitate towards. Um, not not anymore now, it's a bit more. Um, when I was a kid, it was only fantasy, I think it was my thing. Um, and then I started to read uh, books that were set in England and Scotland. Um, and I started to be fascinated by uh, the British culture. Uh, then I, as I grew older, I started to learn even the darkest sides, let's say, of, of British culture. And I ended up finding that thrilling as well. I loved it. Um, uh, of course, as, I mean, stuff like that. And, you know, yeah. it just sort of, it gives you the rough side as well. And it's, it's amazing. It just, I felt like, I really need to see these places. And um, when I was about, I think the first time I um, I came here on holiday with my sister, I was 18. It was my 18th birthday present from my family. Um, and I then, I went to London other like nine times after that. I would, every time I had holiday, I would go um, to the UK, which means that now that I moved to the UK, I haven't really been anywhere else. I only go to Italy and to the UK from into, but, but yeah, I'll, I'll get around to going to other places as well because it's a bit sad, but it just speaks to how committed I am in my love for, for this culture. And that's one of the reasons why, even though I learned other languages, I can, I can speak other languages. I, I did French, I did Spanish. I would never say that I can translate them um, because even though I can get by, I can speak, I can understand, that's, that's fine, that's one thing. But I can't really, I don't know the culture that well. I don't know, I haven't lived there. There's, I haven't read many novels in the original language. There's so much you can't understand if you don't really live the culture. How, how important is that culture aspect, sort of like the slang um, and the the way, because obviously language is changing all the time. Um, yeah. So how like, how important so, is that to translate? Um, for instance, there's, um, you know, Anne Goldstein, the translator of Elena Ferrante. So um, many people reading Elena Ferrante in English think that she must write in Italian in dialect. But she doesn't, in fact. Um, 
and she gives a lot of reasons for it. Uh, partly because um, it's just uh, she talks about dialect as the language of home, um, of strong emotions. Children speak dialect, uh, whilst Italian is more like your language of it symbolizes education, going away from your home, knowing the bigger picture. Um, and she she just says that dialect is mainly for the spoken word and uh, certain parts certain parts of the text i guess could lose their you know their poignance um and of course you need the rich language of italian to describe certain things and she's got i mean her prose is amazing um so nothing to take out of authors that use dialects like uh, as i say i was on about uh, irving welsh earlier i love how it's written in in Scottish, but what the Italian translator of his books did, which I'm fairly sure it's the same one, his um can't remember his name, Massimo something. <laughs> um he created this sort of like colloquial uneducated Italian oh. caked in swear words completely. Uh, but he recreated this like crisp, crude Scottish dialect. Uh, and train spotting, filth, um, glue, porno, they were huge in Italy. Um, and arguably, thanks to the translator, in a way. That's so interesting. I had no idea. I didn't even like consider, obviously, Irvin Welsh's books are, must be, like, you must get that as a translator and be like, what? <laughs> exactly. Like, I, I, I hadn't read them. I'm reading now a couple, I'm, I'm reading filth now in uh, in English, and it's it's really hard to understand, even though... As they have tried to educate myself as as well as I could in the Scottish dialect, but it's still super hard. <laughs> I just don't know how to read certain words. They just make no sound in my head, and I'm like, oh, how do I do this? Uh, so, why um, do you have one direction of translation that you prefer to translate in? Um, well, I. I prefer to do a better job and of course I do that by translating from English into Italian because I just feel more comfortable understanding English culture instead of interpreting into English culture because I don't, I'm not yet that comfortable to feel like I definitely made this sound natural to an English speaker, to a British person, whatever. It's also very hard to translate in English for both American and British audience. You never translate for targeting one or the other. So you have to find a standard English and culture for everybody, which makes it a bit, takes it away a little bit because by living in Britain, you're like, I know exactly how to translate this, but I can't because of course Americans wouldn't get it or, you know Australians and it's just it's just very different so you need to instead of zooming too much in um from something that is very precise maybe in your source text so I don't know you're translating from a Sicilian book with Sicilian culture and you need to just take it so far out and so relatable to all anglicized countries yeah. that uh, you're never going to do it perfectly uh, so what I prefer to do is doing the opposite. So I prefer to give to Italians because I don't know because Italian is mainly only spoken in Italy, so you don't have to talk to that <laughs> many, you know, people. So maybe yeah, definitely that direction, English into Italian. Um, is there? A, that's so interesting. <laughs> um, are there particular differences between? Um, obviously, you don't have like loads of experience in literary translation. But what was it about audio and visual that drew you, and what sort of specialities does it have? So this um, this one mainly, I I like everything. I like interpreting. I like literary translation, and I like audiovisual. Although I I don't think everybody's supposed to do anything you need to ask yourself what are you good at um, and I'm very good at following rules in a way um, there's too much freedom in literature uh, too <laughs> many choices and too much to go I, I have a tremendous respect for literary translators and I I don't like it when people read books and go like oh this translation is disgusting and then because it's like you need to understand that there were a billion things that person could have chosen to do 
and they have to think of their priorities. Um, I'm going to talk about priorities in literary translations later. Uh, for now, as I say, I, I just ask myself, can you do interpreting? Interpreting is about translating super fast. You need a fast decision. You need to prioritize, um, you know, maybe not the exact meaning, but a fast one that people will understand. I could never do that. Um, I would say if, if, you know, I would say my best thing is I can translate correctly with the right time, you know, not too fast, not too slow, uh, but with rules. With I, I love a set of rules because I feel like I'm safer, um, which arguably is a little sad, but hey. And that's subtitling because you have a specific number of, um, you know, words, lines, um, punctuation must be used in a certain way, um, you have to summarise what's being said in a certain way, you have to go from one subtitle to the next in a certain way, you don't want to overlap subtitles over screen changes, you have to know what the eyes do when you look at a film, so you know that you don't want to make a sentence too difficult, otherwise you, you're going to read the sentence again and again and you're never going to look at the screen. So it's it's funny, I, I, I sorry, it's fun. I like to to play that way, to sort of go like, yes, this is perfect, because you read it, it's immediate, then you have all the time in the world to look. Um, I really like it. Yeah, it does. There's so much, with everything in translation, there's so much more to it than like you would maybe think because I think especially in a world where we're used to um, YouTube videos having captions and often they're actually done by people who volunteer to do the captions. Yeah. Aren't they? Um, that, that, I mean, of course, they're doing, they're doing it for free. So again, mm -hmm. I don't like I don't like the idea of someone criticizing their translation because that's free work. Like nobody's paying them to do it. Um, so <clears throat> not that it should be, I mean, I don't like it when something is translated in a way that you clearly could have chosen to do the right thing, but it's somehow for no reason, a completely different take and it can be confusing for the viewer. Uh, but most of the things that people criticize are very simple, tiny things that is like, okay, you just want to show that you know that word, how it's translated in that language, but you have to understand that it's not exactly how the process goes. So I love fan subs. I love um, YouTube translation. Even if they're not perfect, you can see that there's passion there. And they go, of course, um, automated captions are a completely different thing. They just come from audio and they're terrible sometimes. <laughs> but it's the fastest thing. So if you want something to be translated immediately and you want to enjoy it right then in the moment, you'll have to sort of, you know, go with the flow like you do with uh, interpreting. I mean, listening to an interpreter can be confusing sometimes depending on, um, yeah, the, the situation, but you get the gist. <laughs> yeah. Um, can we go back to that point about the sort of priorities of literary translation? Yes, absolutely. So uh, there are different methods um, from translator to translator, of course. You study them all when you're in uni and then you kind of decide what direction you want to go to. I did my undergrad in a method called uh, Scopus theory, um, which is basically, basically says that the most important thing is the aim of the piece that you're writing, whether it's a film or a book or whatever, you need to ask the author or the publisher or whoever owns the work, what is the aim of this? Do you want to, I don't know, to book about uh, animals? Do you want to convince people to go vegan? Do you want to, I don't know, just talk about how cute animals are. Do, do you just don't care and you just want the, the beautiful prose in the book? Um, are animals just a symbol? You just want to use the language as your beautiful, you know, message. And you ask them, there needs to be this communication between author and translator, otherwise it's gonna inevitably go wrong. It's not, it, I mean, it's nobody's fault. It's just you need communication. Um, then the priority right under that, it's, it's quite, it's a pyramid actually. I might be mm. able to, no, it's I a, don't know how to. to I actually, um, I actually feel like I might know this, so this can be a test, because there's like three parts to it, isn't it? There's the purpose, then there's the, um, 
like faithfulness is the third part like sort of so it's it's divided yeah. in five but i oh. think it's been it's been summarized into three in some texts because it's easier because some are just a bit but it's uh it's five and then the sixth sort of says all the ones above are to be considered in hierarchical order with the 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 aim dominating all the others so you've got aim you've got that the translation has to be an offer of information so it's not truth it's an offer from the translator of look this is what was said so the the second principle is is, is an offer of information of another offer of information that was done in the source uh, culture and the source language so it's a diluted text you, it's never going to be the same experience as the original then the third is that is not clearly reversible which means that of course you're never going to flip it on its head and it's going to turn back into the um the source language and um, it's it must be internally coherent and then it must be coherent with the source text uh, and that's it and that's your priority so this means that the fact that it's coherent with the source text is definitely not as important as it needs to be an offer of information. It's definitely not as important as the aim. So that's how I guess one should translate, but that's my personal take. So you're gonna see a lot of difference. Mm. Uh, I'm definitely not a purist. Um, so I guess there's a lot of texts that I wouldn't be the best person uh, to translate. Um, I don't mind changing a text, uh, but I think you have to work side by side by side with the author at all times because you can't just decide to change something i've seen stuff that was scary there's um <laughs> like in stephen king um there's um this book called firestarter and um there's a scene in which uh, there's a waitress so the the text says that um they sat at the um, at the bar and this waitress with a fine figure comes um and in italian <laughs> it was it was disgusting it was translated as um a waitress with a fine figure wearing a flowery dress with an ample cleavage <laughs> completely added out of nowhere and i don't know what it was it was probably a decision from the publisher i don't think it was the translator because why would you unless you thought that that specific part needed you to be specifically attracted to that waitress i have no idea why the flowers no no but um it's a lot of little things that make you think okay this is strange but fascinating i guess um and there are a lot of examples like that uh, there are just mistakes out of um usually uh that they're, they're under pressure they have to give the work quite quickly so they're not going to check things twice even though the person they give the word the translation to should check that's the proofreading they should do it so it's it's not okay to blame the translator only there are a number of people that check it um for instance in harry potter there are like italian facebook groups only talking about all the mistakes that there are in the translations because of course we all grew up and we all learned english because we all loved britain after harry potter so now we, we can all see all the various mistakes i think the most famous ones is the locket there is this locket in the sixth volume of harry potter and it was translated in italian as padlock instead of what it actually <laughs> is so that was really confusing because you couldn't understand why someone would wear this padlock <laughs> um, so sometimes it is really really dangerous and you have to always always ask from the the aim to any doubt that comes in your head you should be able to communicate directly with the author but it's not always possible it's i mean usually it's not possible so i understand <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> so interesting hearing about specific examples um are there, any... <laughs> <laughs> are there any others that you have that you crave um so sometimes it, it, it happens oh, oh well yeah actually talking about fantasy um gr martin game of thrones there's volume one um there's this scene where the stark brothers and ned stark the father find this um dead wolf mother and um 
the cause of death in the book, of course, is discovered. It, it has these like antlers in, in its neck and that's how it died. And um, in Italian, it was translated as unicorn horn, <laughs> which of course puts a lot of confusion there because of course you have to include unicorns in the whole universe, <laughs> which of course they don't come back ever because they didn't exist in the first place. And um, and of course, later on, in new editions, of course, they, they took care of it because the other problem was that it's, it, was, it was symbolic because the stag is the symbol of the other house in uh, one of the other houses in Game of Thrones, which is the Baratheon house. And of course, it was a symbol of, you know, Baratheon killing the wolf, which is the symbol of the Stark house. So it was a huge mistake because, <laughs> of course, you would have had to change the Baratheon house to a unicorn instead of a stag and it would have been dreadful so some are really some some mistakes really matter um then um smaller ones uh, and usually they're only because there are different translators for a saga so i don't know the um, or even different translators for an author that tends to write i don't know like kurt vonnegut mm. six translators in italy with the same publishing house which is dreadful for, you know, Kurt Vonnegut readers will know. Every book kind of intertwines with the other characters come back. Uh, little things are sort of like, it's very fun to read his novels. But that's the thing. If you have different translators, they might not check the other translations. At some things you just can't really understand. You'll, you'll never figure out, maybe you'll figure out some characters have come back because the names will be the same but certain references will be lost and it's a shame because, you yeah. know. Um, it's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> it is a shame. Um, Harry Potter had five different translators as well and they had consultants, consultants as well. So that makes, I don't know, 12 people involved in the whole thing and names were changed because uh, that's the, the problem in Harry Potter is not translating the book must be quite easy because it's a very simple language. Problem is, names songs places they're all very like you know names with a meaning right so you need to translate that and they're, they're very different from book to book sometimes and it's quite annoying yeah but yeah pulls you out of the continuity um if you had to recommend some books that have been translated from italian into english for people who were looking um to read a bit more italian literature where would you start um, if you like thriller, I was thinking Andrea Camilleri's The Shape of Water is the first one of a series. It's really good, uh, set in Sicily, so it gives you a really good vibe of what it's like there. Um, then uh, Donato Carisi, The Vanished Ones, is really good. And Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose is a bit bigger, is a bit heavier, but it's an amazing gothic thriller. Great. Um, if you like dramas, so these are, are quite a bit heavy, but that they're really worth the pain. Um, there's Don't Move by Margaret Mazzantini. Um, there's El Samorante's Arturas Island, really, really good. It's set in Naples. Um, so if you like um, that kind of stuff, uh, like um, Camilleri, it's kind of the same, but set in a different part of Italy. It gives you a really good vibe of the place. Um, and then Oriana Fallaci, A Man amazing book luckily it's available it is the one that i wanted to recommend um the ones that are a little harder to find but they're worth it are the historical ones there's um cesare pavese's books about second world war and the resistance initially um the moon and the bonfires is amazing house on the hill and um one called it's a collection of three books it's called the beautiful summer and there's specifically one called among women only that is really great um, and then there's, if you like, like Roman, ancient Roman historical ones, Valerio Massimo Manfredi and everything he wrote, basically, they're all great. But The Last Legion is my favorite. It's the one they made the film out of. Amazing. Um, and then there's one by Dasha Mariani called Train to Budapest. That's really good as well. It's actually not Budapest in Italian. It's another city. Not sure why they changed it. Uh, I didn't know myself because I only read it in Italian. So when I went to look for it, I was really confused. But I'm, I'm sure it's wonderfully translated. So that's really worth it. And then if you like teen fiction, something like Coming of Age, stuff like that. Um, 
Jack Frusciante has left the band by Enrico Brizzi is amazing and I'm going to put them all in a little document I'm going to send it to you. Pretty much, I'm absolutely um, going to post a photo of the, the recommendations that I'm going to get B to send me on. Um, so if you want to see a full list of recommendations from B. Yeah, I'll put some light stuff as well. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. That was such a joy um, and I learned so much. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. I had a lot of fun. Thank you for inviting me and it's so good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye.